Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be exploring a phenomenon of the late 20th century, the cult of information. And my guest, Dr. Theodore Rozak, is a professor of history at California State University at Hayward and also chairman of the Department of General Studies there. Perhaps more importantly, Dr. Rozak is the author of numerous books and several novels, including The Making of the Counterculture, Where the Wasteland Ends, and most recently, The Cult of Information. Welcome to the program, Ted. Glad to be here, Jeff. It's a pleasure to have you uh, here. But tell me, what do you have against information? Well, I'll tell you a little story, Jeff, that illustrates the problem my book's addressed to. Uh, <coughs> not too long ago, I, well, a few years back, I was in my office at school, uh, sharing an office with uh, someone from the English department. And uh, a student was talking with the professor about a, an assignment that had to do with uh, a poem by Robert Frost. And uh, I was vaguely aware of the conversation that was going on. And I heard my colleague saying to the student, um, I want you to try to draw all the information out of this poem. And uh, she used that phrase several times. Um, this was supposed to be the uh, uh, approach to the uh, assignment. And when the student left, I asked her, um, what information uh, are you talking about? Uh, I know the poem, and I don't think there's much information in it. She said, well, I mean the metaphors and the similes and the symbols. And, uh, and I said, you call all of that information? And uh, she stopped a moment, thought, and said, uh, yes. And it suddenly struck me about that time that I had been hearing the word information again and again used mm -hmm. in various contexts in uh, more and more ambitious and perhaps even global ways. And it struck me that uh, information is becoming the God word of our time. And uh, it should be pretty obvious why that's happening. It's because we live in an age when one of the most powerful elements in our culture uh, is the invention of the computer, the research and development on the computer. And the computer is an information processing machine. And if you want to sell a lot of computers in a society, you have to convince people that information is terribly important mm. and give it the most ambitious possible uh, definition so that it covers more and more ground and becomes uh, seemingly more and more vital. Now, it struck me that uh, this sort of a development, especially in the field of education, dealing with, whether you're dealing with kids in kindergarten or students in, in the university. Applying the term information to the understanding yeah, that of poetry. This is, right, that this, there's a problem here, yeah. that certain distinctions are being obscured I can that imagine are a, basic to any culture. Uh -huh. And uh, among them, there's the distinction between information mm -hmm. and uh, knowledge and uh, judgment and wisdom. And it struck me that these are vital distinctions, that they have a kind of hierarchical arrangement, that some are more important than others, and that as a matter of fact, information is perhaps the least important of them all. And to let the word information simply spread until it covers all intellectual categories uh, seemed to me potentially disastrous for a student's ability to think. It would be a, 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 implying, for example, as if you could take the music of Bach and do a mathematical analysis of, of the notes so that you would then understand Bach. Yes, and you can do such an analysis. Uh -huh. You can do a mathematical analysis of many things, and you may then understand it at a certain level, whatever the phenomenon might be. <coughs> it struck me, as I thought more and more about this, that as a matter of fact, what's far more central to thinking, to the, what I call the art of thinking in my book, uh, is the mastery of ideas. Cultures are based upon ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think a moment, you may realize that many of the most important ideas around which our culture is uh, based uh, have no information in them whatsoever. They're not based on information. The ideas are of an entirely different intellectual Metaphysical character. Metaphysical ideas. Yeah, well, example. let me give you a very familiar idea that mm -hmm. is, uh, all of us recognize immediately, and it's, we all recognize its importance. Take the idea, all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. 
That's an idea we inherit out of the 18th century. It's absolutely basic to our political life. It's the basis of our jurisprudence. It has launched revolutions throughout the world. It's a powerful idea. There's absolutely no information in that idea. It would be hard to imagine a more powerful idea. Right, and you can't imagine any body of fact that is related to that idea. Mm -hmm. So if you ask, what's that idea based upon? It's based upon something I would call experience, and especially moral vision. The idea was not created by people who had done research on the subject of human equality. Mm -hmm. The idea was based rather upon the moral insight of a generation that had come to f find great sympathy for democratic politics, for the natural rights of man, mm -hmm. um, these were the great objectives and goals of that generation. And out of that was born this powerful idea that all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. Well, the longer you think about it, uh, the more you realize that what I call the master ideas of any culture have almost no relationship to information. Mm -hmm. um, the Tao that can be named is not the true Tao, right? Uh, there is but one God and Allah is his prophet. Mm -hmm. Uh, on and on. The great religious ideas, the great theological ideas, the great moral ideas uh, have no relationship to information whatsoever. But, but science as a whole has never really pretended to offer moral or religious teachings, has it? But even the great ideas of science mm -hmm. usually start as visions, uh, insights, theories, and once they become theories, they sometimes will help generate information. Mm -hmm. I think most scientists would now agree that you don't create great scientific ideas by putting pieces of information together the way computers put bits of information together. Yeah. That there is initially some sort of a vision or an insight into the operations of nature. Out of this comes a theory. Mm -hmm. The theory then directs attention in such a way that it might help people find information that perhaps corroborates yeah. the idea. In other words, the relationship uh, between ideas and information is exactly the opposite of what people in the computer sciences yeah. seem to believe. Namely, it is ideas that generate information. It is not information that generates ideas. Yeah. And to lose track of that fact, it seemed to me, was to court disaster in our intellectual lives. I wonder if you're not putting it a little too strongly, though. Isn't it somewhat reciprocal, actually? Sure, there's a re reciprocity, but you mustn't lose track of the importance of no. the initial idea, which is often born of experience. And experience is not something that easily uh, reduces to mm -hmm. uh, facts and figures mm -hmm. and so on. In fact, what experience is is so deeply metaphysical that it would uh, be difficult for me to define it for you, but we all know yeah. what our experience is. And it seemed to me that what people needed to operate in the world successfully, whether they're kids or grown-ups, was the ability to discriminate among ideas. Mm -hmm. And what I call the cult of information, which is so focused on information processing and the information processing model of the human mind, mm. which is very popular among computer scientists and people in artificial intelligence and research. Many people, even in the counterculture, yeah. talk of themselves as like a biocomputer. Yeah, well, I mean, there's something behind that image that's interesting, too. Um, but it seems to me that this evaluation of idea, uh, mm -hmm. of information as being somehow the supreme element in yeah. any culture uh, is a, a very misleading mm -hmm. idea. And I wrote the book primarily as a sort of a humanist's mm -hmm. uh, approach a to, the, to the computer and its proper mm -hmm. place in our society and especially mm -hmm. in education. In, in psychology, academic psychology today, the information processing model of the mind is very big. Oh, this is the one of the biggest uh, ideas going. Incidentally, mm -hmm. let me show you how involuted or tricky this becomes. Uh, the very uh, suggestion that the mind is an information processing instrument is an idea. Yeah. Right? So it's almost impossible ever to get behind ideas. Right. Uh, ideas are what generate research, they're what finally produces bodies of fact, bodies of evidence, and this too is, an, the computer is an idea um, based upon certain conceptions of number and how they can be manipulated. The information processing conception of thought 
is an idea. Mm -hmm. It's only one idea about the human mind. I tend to think of it as a very poor idea in comparison to the ideas of Plato or Aristotle mm -hmm. or Spinoza, who also had ideas mm -hmm. about the mind. But all of these are ideas. And it seemed to me the essence of education was to teach students how to deal with ideas, and especially big ideas or master ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I refer to them. Because not all ideas are good ideas. A lot of ideas are bad ideas or toxic yeah. ideas. Even the master ideas might be toxic. Right. Uh, there are cultures that have built themselves or political movements or social movements that have built themselves around uh, master ideas that are deeply harmful, vicious, mm -hmm. negative, destructive, right? Ideas of a master race, for example. All of these are ideas. And sometimes they're so pervasive, we right. don't even realize that we're holding a mere idea. We think that this is reality. But I would challenge people to reflect upon what it means to think. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that what they would discover is that, for the most part, what they're doing is manipulating ideas. Now, they may be mm -hmm. doing that well, or they may be doing that poorly. But it seems to me the function of education is to teach them how to manipulate ideas well, how to compare them with one another, how to discriminate among them, and perhaps even how to invent their own ideas. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to me that it was a major liability of um, our computerized culture that we were vastly over-evaluating the importance of information, which seems to me to be the lowest level Mm -hmm. of the mind, at which the mind functions. Now, the mind does process information. I'll give you an example of that. Looking up a telephone number is essentially processing information. Yeah, data retrieval. Right, a data retrieval. Buying a, a plane ticket, uh, choosing which uh, airline to use and which flight to use and so on is uh, clearly information processing. That's Decision why, making at a pretty simple level. At a very simple level. Mm -hmm. And that's why things like this, looking up phone numbers, you know. Uh, choosing uh, which flight to take have been properly computerized mm -hmm. and adequately so and I have you know no dispute about the value of the computer as an information processing machine mm -hmm. and we need to process a lot of information in our lives and so it's good to have a machine that does that but to call everything the mind does information processing seems to me deeply misleading and simply warps the art mm -hmm. of thinking so it would be a great danger to teach students uh, for the sake of some manipulation of a computer that their mind is essentially a computer and that when they think they are processing information. My sense is when you uh, describe the development of these master ideas that while they're not based on information in terms of little bits, they, there's a sense that they're based on a holistic perception, uh, an intuition of the nature of things as a whole. Yeah, and that might be what I'm calling experience, mm -hmm. which is a broad, sloppy term that's extremely difficult to refine or define, but we all know mm -hmm. what it is and we shouldn't be talked out of the fact that we all experience things, right? And we tend to experience them in a, in a kind of broad, holistic way. We experience events in our lives. Uh, we learn things out of the process of everyday living, out of the people we meet, raising children, walking through the world, doing a certain job. Where all of this becomes the experience out of which we draw ideas or the, the various sensibilities that allow us to respond to the ideas we hear, mm -hmm. political ideas, religious yeah. ideas, and so on. But that's essentially what's going on when we do the most important kind of thinking in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, while the computer is a very valuable instrument to have for numerous uses, it seemed to me that uh, this was one of its great liabilities, that it was uh, being over-evaluated as a model of the human mind and in that respect was doing great pedagogical or educational damage. I mean, there are many people today, I suppose, who quite literally think of themselves as a computer. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, if you tried to trace the history of the word information, there would be a point, a crucial point, where mm -hmm. uh, uh, you had a, a remarkable coincidence that at about the same time the computer was becoming, was gaining visibility on the social mm -hmm. scene, the late 40s, early 50s. The discovery of DNA. There was a breakthrough in mm -hmm. biology. Yes. The discovery of DNA. And at that time, the biologists were casting around for a model, a mm -hmm. paradigm, uh, by the light of which they might better understand the function of the double helix yes. of DNA. Genetics. And they reached out and took the um, cybernetics information transfer technology as their model. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we now know that that might not be at all an adequate model of what actually goes on in the uh, genetic mm -hmm. material. But at the time, it was an extremely tempting connection to make. And out of that came the image of DNA as a biocomputer, that it was a little string of bits. And somehow, yeah. if you added all the bits up, you got an organism. It takes a genetic right. code and yeah. encodes it in terms of molecules yeah. ordered, and then it replicates it perfectly. And all of this l lent uh, some credibility to the idea that DNA mm -hmm. was an information processing mechanism, mm -hmm. right? And since we then believe that DNA was the secret of life, right. it was like saying that information was the secret of mm -hmm. life. And it's quite interesting because this is exactly what happened in the 17th century when scientists were looking for a model of the universe uh -huh. and they came up with the clock. The clock. We were like that we clockwork. Live in a, <laughs> right, we live in a clockwork universe mm -hmm. and God is the great watchmaker in the sky. As of the early 1950s, it's almost as if the great watchmaker became the great cosmic programmer. Mm -hmm. And it became conventional for people to refer to their thinking as being programmed, to speak of their psyche, of the uh, structure of the genetic yeah. material, all of this being programmed. And you should bear in mind, this is nothing but an image or a paradigm or a model. And it may or may not be adequate. Where does it break down? Well, I'm not enough of a biologist to investigate this, except that there have been many findings in contemporary uh, biological research that make it questionable that this is a good model. Mm -hmm. That is, a, uh, if you begin asking where is the program in yeah. this computer called DNA, that's mm -hmm. a very difficult question to answer. So the model may not be a good one. However, historically speaking, as of the early 50s, that was a crucial if mm -hmm. fortuitous connection between a field called cybernetics which had developed independently and the new biology and at that point the word information took on a luster mm -hmm. uh, a status a prestige that it had never had before because it seemed to be the very secret of life itself mm -hmm. and of course the computer industry as a whole was quite willing to go along with the idea yes Information is the secret of life. It's the key to the universe. You need more and more of it by a computer, uh -huh. right? So you might almost say that from the 50s on, we've had a kind of merchandising project going, the main purpose of which has been to sell mm -hmm. computers for more and more uses. And one of the ways you do that is by expanding the meaning, the prestige, mm -hmm. the uh, luster of information and convincing people you need more and more of uh -huh. it and if you don't know uh, how to manipulate an information processing machine you're not a full-fledged citizen of the 20th century you won't get a job you won't make it through school and so on. In other words there's a subtle conspiracy between the uh, world of merchandising and advertising and people who would have us believe in certain mechanistic materialistic yeah. models that genes can explain our, our biology or perhaps that neurons yeah. and nerve firing can explain the mind. Right and I wouldn't call it a conspiracy so much as a sort of an, a marriage of convenience between a couple right. of different developments in our society that have led people, uh, more and more people, to accept a, an almost global conception of information as somehow being the secret of life, of the mind. The mind is an information processing machine. The genetic material is an information processing machine. Uh, this has become uh, so widespread and so commonplace that we don't even reflect upon it anymore. Well, the purpose of my book is to get people to reflect upon exactly what the value and status of information is in their lives mm -hmm. and to recognize that it's a very low level of importance, that there are other levels at which the mind functions. And we can't even categorize all of those levels because they may indeed go up to metaphysical insight, ESP, God knows what all. But the mind is vastly larger than its information processing mm -hmm. level. Perhaps an example of what you're saying might just be the high divorce rate in Silicon Valley, where, where so many programmers almost become addicted to their work and lose touch with their emotional relationships. Well, you might say that they lose track of what? Maturity, wisdom, I don't know. But I mean, uh -huh. clearly there are other levels of life that don't respond to information processing. There are many problems or issues in life. Mm -hmm. However, um, I mean, just think for a moment the way the news of the day is reported to yeah. us. Think of how our politics go. How much of this is simply the regurgitation of information, of data, of numbers, of statistics. Mm -hmm. We go through elections where it seems that what is uh, most vital to the people reporting the elections and the public at large is polling. Yeah. And again, polling is something that computers do, right? Yeah. And so we place the computer at the center of the entire process and sort of reduce the process to what the computer does so well, I'm which is to generate facts, mm -hmm. figures 
figures, numbers, statistics. And in the midst of all of this, what gets lost are issues. Yeah. And issues are based upon ideas people have that lead them to ask questions. Questions about justice, fairness, decency, uh, sanity, and so on. All of which should be the, the, uh, the true subjects of debate mm -hmm. in our political life. Instead, all of this gets swamped in an outpouring of raw data, of information, as if that's the most important thing taking place. Are we trying to bury our heads in the sand, maybe, and, and use this mass of information as a way of avoiding what, what's really facing well, us? Well, you know, what we have here is a style of the times. Um, mm -hmm. We fancy ourselves an age of information in the same way that, uh, I think, much more commendably, our four bearers thought of themselves as an age of reason. Mm -hmm. uh, I would much prefer to be an age of faith, an age of discovery, an age of reason than um, an age of information. Mm -hmm. But it becomes the style of the times to try to regurgitate as much information as possible. And I think that's one of the things that we find um, lacking or failing in the general quality of our public life especially, mm -hmm. uh, that we are inundated with information, glutted with it, mm -hmm. whereas what we need often to get a grip on the world we live in are a few good ideas, a few good issues to argue about, and that has nothing to do with mastering information. Mm -hmm. So my thought is that in the educational process, uh, what we should do is start with something very traditional. Uh, the great books, the great ideas, teach students how to handle great ideas which are found in great books. What we need is good old-fashioned literacy rather than computer literacy. Mm -hmm. It seems to me computer literacy is something that can wait because it deals with something much less important in our intellectual life, namely the processing, collection storage processing of data. That it seems to me should play very little part in a true education. I mean, the idea that every student needs to know computer programming yeah, seems off we, base to you. And doing that simply crowds out far more vital things that students need to learn. You mm -hmm. see, it seems to me that you don't really need, a, in the modern world, the world we live in from day to day, it's a mistake to believe that you need a bigger and bigger electronic filing cabinet called a computer to keep track of all the data. What you need are ideas mm -hmm. that tell you what data matters and what data uh, don't matter. Mm -hmm. And to, to sort your way through the jungle of facts, what you need up here right, mm -hmm. are some good ideas about the world. Uh, and that's what education should start with, the importance of those ideas. And those things are to be learned in good old traditional ways, out of books, art, music. Mm -hmm. what, what about our current political situation, the crisis we're facing, overpopulation, we're dealing with the potential of thermonuclear war, we're dealing with starvation worldwide. Do, are we creating some of these problems because we're not focusing in on our, the basic values, because we're losing ourselves in this sea of information? Well, I'll tell you one political issue which is an excellent example of what the over-evaluation of information, information processing, and computers may lead to. It is now a serious proposition in this country that we should entrust the survival of the nation to a weapon system called the Strategic Defense Initiative, which has a great deal of technology associated with it, and we don't quite know all the technology, but what we do know is that the, at the heart of it there will be computers, the most elaborate, the most densely programmed computers the mind can imagine. And what we will be entrusting to those machines as supposedly thinking machines that supposedly possess something called artificial intelligence are certain judgments about war and peace and therefore about human survival, which is far beyond anything that human beings should ever entrust mm -hmm. To machines. And we already have computers that are monitoring our, our defenses as they oh, yes. exist now. Oh yes, and we, have, we are more and more prepared to allocate to those machines crucial judgments about our life. Mm -hmm. And if you ask why that's happening, I would suggest that the general public has been sold on the idea that those machines are indeed capable of thinking that thinking is information processing, that a machine that has a lot of data in it and processes it, processes it very quickly is actually thinking and therefore it can be entrusted with tasks that properly are the, should belong to a human mind. 
I mean, you can, I've read uh, lesson plans for uh, kids that will try to convince them that computers are better minds than they have because they don't make mistakes and they always have the right answer. Right? Mm. Uh, that's a fatal thing to teach children because, mm -hmm. uh, the, again, the computer operates only at a certain very minimal level of thinking. The art of thinking vastly transcends that. And when you get to the level of great judgments in politics, law, social policy, what you need is a, a fully developed human mind capable of dealing with issues and ideas. And that's far beyond what a computer can do. Yeah. But you know, I find that amongst my friends who are really into computers, programmers, for example, that they have wide-ranging interests very often oh, yes. and, and, and do have fully developed minds. Well, so. I'm not suggesting that can't be true. Yeah. And, and, and what you're talking about is the quality of their minds. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I'm asking is how much of anybody's mind can indeed be encompassed by, uh, mimicked by, or uh, uh, matched by the operations of a computer. That's a very different question. And we hear from the artificial intelligence establishment that, you know, eventually computers will be almost human. Eventually, they would uh, almost say within three years, five years, yeah. right around the corner. That's right. And uh, I, uh, in my book, I take great issue with mm -hmm. the people in artificial intelligence on the grounds that that field has been around since the 1950s. And it has been promising successes, breakthroughs ever since then, uh, within three years, five years, always just around the corner, yeah. right at hand, uh, that have uh, not yet been accomplished. It's a field so filled with an overweening self-confidence, mm -hmm. perhaps because it's so richly funded by the government, by the military, by the corporations, that it has been tempted to make promises it cannot fulfill. So artificial intelligence, it seems to me, as a field of study, is one of the most vastly inflated and oversold um, studies or fields of study in our society today. Where would you redirect all of that funding? Would you just see it go into the humanities at this point? Oh, I don't think just into the humanities, but in, in the field of education, I would simply plunk for a curriculum that uh, was a little more traditional, that stayed closer to uh, old-fashioned forms of literacy, uh, and uh, sought to put uh, children as uh, gracefully and as early as possible in touch with the great ideas on which their culture is based. Mm -hmm. uh, ask them to probe those ideas, uh, discuss those ideas, uh, compare them with one another, and uh, reach personal judgments about the great ideas of the culture they live in. I don't see that computers have any role whatsoever to play in that. What you need are teachers, sensitive teachers, great books, great art, great music, great science. Uh, all of these things play a role in teaching children how to cope uh -huh. with the richness of the ideas uh -huh. they inherit out of their tradition. Uh -huh. Well, Theodore Rozak, thank you very much for being with me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Jeff. And thank you very much for being with us.